Hi, I'm Tim Autry. Welcome to Principle 3, Enable and Align, the Principle of Power. The Dhammapada, the ancient book of Buddhist wisdom, tells us, those who have achieved victory over other people can be defeated in future battles, but those who have achieved victory over themselves become victors forever. This gives us a great introduction to the concepts of power, control, and self-control. Let me begin by telling you a story. We were getting ready to sit down to one of my favorite meals, my wife's amazing eggplant parm, Caesar salad, and lots of garlic bread. I was opening a bottle of Cabernet. There was a knock at the kitchen door. It was Betsy, one of our daughter's friends who lived a couple blocks away. Her stuffed backpack in tow, she had tears streaming down her cheeks. As our daughters came downstairs and my wife took Betsy into the living room, the phone rang. Is she there? Her dad asked. Yes, she's here and she's safe, I replied. Betsy had just run away from home. Her mom and dad were friends and co-workers of mine. They were nice people, however, as parents, they were incredibly over-controlling. As a casual observer of Betsy's interactions with her parents, I was surprised this hadn't happened sooner. Betsy stayed with us for the next couple of days. To be honest, I don't remember what happened directly thereafter. However, her behaviors and rebellion and the unfortunate choices that went along with them continued to degenerate over the next couple of years. What's this got to do with you and me and your family and team members in this workplace? Well, everything. Let's talk about control. Self-control and the paradox of power. As humans interacting with other humans, it's impossible for us to escape the impacts of the distribution of power. I have my concepts about power, and I'm sure you have yours. Love it or hate it, however, we're all involved in the game. You're either seeking and yielding power, or you're a pawn being played by others more powerful than you. The thing is, we are willful beings who crave power. Our desire for power isn't evil or antisocial. It's a natural response to our need to navigate and survive in a complex, competitive, and sometimes hostile world. Well, as humans, we seek and want and need leadership and at least some sense of direction, we cannot stand feelings of powerlessness. What drives much of our behavior is to feel some level of control over our conditions and circumstances that we're receiving in proportion to what we give and that we have the ability to influence our future. What's your take? Some seek to control others. For me, I seek power over myself versus power over others. Now, let's talk about control. Control is the power or authority to guide or manage. And when most of us hear this definition, our minds have been conditioned to think of external control. In other words, you or me either being controlled by others or exerting control over others. Organizations, of course, are forced to comply with laws and regulations, and we clearly need rules, policies, and procedures to govern how we do what we do. As we work and live within systems and societies, most of us recognize this, and we're okay with it. Humans are social creatures and have always tended to congregate to form clans, tribes, and societies. When doing so, we seek to create common guidelines and the sense of direction, safety, and even the comfort that they provide. As I mentioned earlier, you and I tend to feel more comfortable and are even more productive when appropriate boundaries, in other words, controls, are present. And this is true irrespective of age, gender, or our roles in the scheme of whatever conditions or circumstances are present. Problems arise, however, with over-control. When people begin to feel pushed and shoved, their self-control gets tested and tends to diminish. A natural response is to resist, to push back, to rebel. When over-control is allowed to continue, it's just like the pressure inside of a pressure cooker being heated on the stove. Feelings of resentment and their resulting behaviors tend to accumulate and multiply until, at some point, the relief valve lifts. Such was the case with Betsy in the story I told you earlier, and the resulting heartbreak and downward spiral of relationships within her family. Examples of over-control can include micromanaging, for example, which typically stems from the insecurities of those in charge and or their lack of being trustful. 
Check out more about being trustful in principle number one. Another example is commanding and controlling, including rigid rules and expectations, sometimes even using mental and or physical intimidation to remain in charge. This is essentially the bully syndrome. Resistance to delegating can also be considered a mechanism of over-control. This can stem from feeling that no one can do it as well as me, or not being trustful of others' reliability, capabilities, or expertise. And finally, in our brief list of types of over-control, there's what we refer to as ignoring boundaries, which can involve overstepping personal or professional limits, leaving others to feel disrespected. For more on that, see principle two. When humans are over-controlled, <clears throat> resistance and resentment arise. The individual's self-control is stressed and tested, and it can foster a resigned, just tell me what to do mindset. This leads us to a discussion of compliance-based performance. While responses vary somewhat person to person, when falling under the thumb of others in a compliance-based environment, most of us tend to get away with whatever's possible whenever the boss isn't around. This doesn't make us good or bad, it's simply human nature. Do you doubt this? Let me ask you a question. Under ideal driving conditions on an open road with a posted speed limit of 65 miles per hour, where do you set your cruise control? Your answer, which is likely somewhere between 70 and 74 miles per hour, provides a classic representation of what human behavior looks like in a compliance-based environment. When dealing with external controls, you and I continually make choices based upon our internal gauge of risk and reward. And when we consider those external controls to be over-controlling or arbitrary, or we simply don't agree with or believe in them, we test the waters to see how much we can get away with. In the cruise control example, we know that in most states in the United States anyway, drivers are granted a leeway of 10 miles per hour above the posted limit. That's why we limit our speed to somewhere between seven and nine miles per hour above that. Why would you expect your family members or your team members to behave any differently? Over-controlled human beings tend to feel they're being treated like things rather than people. Such feelings contribute to many of the challenges and issues currently plaguing organizations, including lack of engagement, lack of accountability and ownership, and the modern malady of quiet quitting. Beyond this, when people continue to feel pushed and shoved through over-control, their self-control gets tested and often diminishes, which can lead to an eruption of emotion and poor choices. So now, let's talk about self-control. Self-control is the ability of an individual to manage and regulate their urges, their emotions, and their behaviors, especially when they're stressed. Citing his recollections of the horrors of his time as a prisoner in Nazi concentration camps during the Holocaust, Viktor Frankl wrote Man's Search for Meaning. If you haven't yet done so, I highly recommend that you read this book. Let me say it again. If you haven't yet done so, you really must read Man's Search for Meaning. We provided a link to make it super simple for you to grab your copy. My biggest takeaway from Frankel's book is the power each of us has to make choices even under the worst of circumstances. As Dr. Frankel puts it in what's likely the most quoted passage, everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's own attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. An individual sense of their power to choose is directly related to their sense of self-control. According to, to what's called self-determination theory, this isn't something that we just desire or consider nice to have. Some sense of self-control or autonomy is a basic psychological need. With this in mind, let's touch on an area where many leaders and influencers continue to have some misconceptions, motivation. Now we're going to dive into this concept when we cover principle five, the principle of progress. At this point, we're simply going to consider general motivation regarding work. Precept number three of the fundamental precepts of the PPI approach is, we come to work wanting to do a good job. It's been our observation over the past two decades 
present times included, that there is no inherent lack of motivation in the workplace. What's perceived as a lack of motivation, lack of engagement, underperforming, and the currently popular term of quiet quitting are outcomes of poor utilization. Organizational structuring aside, poor utilization is the most often an outcome of team members being overmanaged, underled, understimulated, and over-controlled. This is where leading in a way that grows self-control reaps huge benefits. Higher levels of self-control lead to mastery over impulses, an enhanced sense of well-being, better relationships and interpersonal interactions, and more ethical decision-making. In our short PPI video on human performance entitled, You're Gonna Find Whatever It Is You're Looking For, one of the concluding lines is, it seems to me we just need to let go of the leash. Promoting and enabling higher and higher levels of self-control, vice using external controls, helps grow an environment that generates win-win-win outcomes. This is true in primary relationships, in families, among team members, with friendships, and everywhere in the workplace. Here's your opportunity relative to the dance with which we're all engaged regarding the distribution of power. The environment you create, grow, and support impacts everything. It is almost always stronger than will. Most people can only sustain levels of performance that are supported by the environment in which they find themselves. Your opportunity is to create an environment where all involved have maximum opportunity to contribute, to expand self-control, to earn respect, and to therefore thrive. This involves a proper distribution of power that balances purpose, control, which would be management, direction, rules, and tools, and self-control, again, also known as autonomy. Providing such a balance stimulates, strengthens, and motivates. Sense of purpose generates collective and individual vision and inspiration regarding what's possible and where things are headed. Appropriate levels of control provide guardrails to guide individual choices, actions, and behaviors. Based on an individual's talents, skills, abilities, and responsibilities, as much autonomy or self-control as possible should be allowed and supported. When allowed personal latitude to make choices about what to do and how to do it, individuals get better and better and better at what they do. This is also known as mastery. Making independent choices combined with a sense of progress, which is getting better at what they do, is extremely motivating. And when motivated, individuals will do more right things in right ways, do them better, and elevate their levels of contribution because they want to. In conclusion, the most empowering environment for any family, team, or organization is one that maximizes the attitudes, contributions, and well-being of its members. This is achieved through a distribution of power that minimizes external controls while maximizing opportunities to develop and exercise self-control. Such an environment is where those involved will do right things for right reasons in right ways, even when no one's watching. What's the overall outcome? Highest and best performance manifests when people want to do right things for right reasons.